going to be doing some white knighting for some shorties today. Now, I know some of you are probably thinking, is Jeff joining the Manosphere? Finally, my dreams come true. No, sorry. This is still fitness content. I'm talking about short muscle lengths versus long muscle lengths. So you probably noticed a trend over the past few years towards more lengthened biased movements. Does this make sense? Is this a good idea? Should you do any shortened focused movements? Should shortened focused movements, short muscle lengths, actually get the knife? Short muscle lengths can get the knife. Is this violence warranted? So today I'm going to be making a case for shortened focused movements. Now, first of all, I think it's important to note that according to the literature, there's roughly a 5 to 10% difference in favor of long muscle length training on average. Five to ten percent. That's all on a set by set basis. By the way, some content creators act, they make it seem like it's double the growth or triple or quadruple or ten times the growth where you just won't grow at all on short and focused movements. So it's important to know at the very beginning that the difference is small. And sometimes there's no difference at all. There was a study comparing squats versus hip thrust, which I think is an excellent example because the squat, it's not challenging at the top, but quite challenging at the very bottom. And the hip thrust is the exact opposite. It's not challenging at the bottom, but it's very, very challenging at the top. So these movements are polar opposites, night and day, and yet glute growth was the same. Secondly, due to science being science and trying to isolate one variable, you're usually comparing on a set by set basis. So one set of preacher curls, length and focused, versus one set of spider curls, more contraction focused. However, in my experience, and I think most people would agree with this, often length and focused movements, you just can't do as many sets of. So you're getting more stimulus per set, and I'm not disagreeing that you might get more growth, but you're also getting more fatigue. You can do more sets of contraction focused movements. You can recover faster. You can spam them in your program. They're just not as difficult to recover from. They probably cause less damage, less inflammation. And so I would actually really like to see a study that compared not on a set by set basis, but based on how much people could recover from. So if you can do twice as much volume with a shortened focus movement, which I think in a lot of cases is actually a realistic amount, could be even more, well, what would the growth be like then? Would it just equal out? Maybe you're getting less per set, but you can do more sets and it's kind of a wash. And so if you think about it in terms of stimulus to fatigue ratio, yeah, the length and focus stuff, more stimulus, but also more fatigue, short and focus stuff, less stimulus, but also less fatigue. So you don't know if the ratio is better or worse or the same. So on paper, set by set, yeah, short and focus stuff, it does get the knife, but that's not really how training works. If you can do more and you have the time and the willingness and the ability to recover, maybe you can do more and it could just be a wash or the shortened stuff might even be better. Next, regional hypertrophy. So a muscle has length and you might just think, oh, the tension is the same through the whole muscle. And so when you do a biceps curl, it's gonna hypertrophy equally throughout the muscle now. No, it doesn't. So some movements cause more distal hypertrophy, others cause more proximal hypertrophy. So either farther away or closer. And so I would say including a variety of movements in your program and not just length and focused ones is a good idea. Specifically at the more proximal side of measurement, closer to the shoulder, the pushdown had a slight edge. Meanwhile, at the more distal measurement site, closer to the elbow, the overhead extension had a slight edge. And by the way, the Silver Era guys had this shit figured out. They would do their preacher curls for lower biceps. And for a long time, they were kind of laughed at because science didn't really have the evidence to support that. Well, now it does. Turns out, <gasps> shocking, they were right. Next, and this one's a, maybe a little bit controversial, I find that stretch focused movements, they just beat you up more and take longer to recover from, but they also have a higher risk of injury. Now I don't have the data to support this, but if someone came to me and said, hey, Jeff, I tore my biceps, I wouldn't be thinking, oh, it was a spider curl. There's no tension or very little tension in that lengthened position. So I don't know how you would tear your biceps. Now, if someone said, yeah, I tore my biceps, 
I would probably be thinking maybe a deadlift where you're using an unhearned grip. Don't do that. I don't think that makes sense. Or maybe like a very heavy preacher curl that they're not ready for. Now, I'm not fear mongering, but I do think that on some muscle groups, maybe biceps, pecs, perhaps hamstrings, especially if you have a history of tweaks and tears, you might just want to avoid these super, super stretching movements in favor of maybe a higher volume of sets of contraction focused movements, because at the very least, they're going to be a little bit safer. Furthermore, if you're working around an injury, maybe you have biceps tendonitis or you have high hamstring tendinopathy. I mean, if you have an upper hamstring injury that's pissed off, I mean, an RDL is probably just completely off the table, but a, a standing hamstring curl that is most challenging at the top and has very little tension at the bottom might feel amazing. That might actually be a nice sort of rehab movement to get you healthy again, and then you can introduce more stretch-focused movements later. So yeah, there is a use, not just in terms of pure hypertrophy. What do you do when everything is perfect? Well, sometimes things are not perfect and you have to work around injury or equipment limitations or other factors. And so having a wide range of tools in your toolbox is probably a good idea. For example, Jeff Cavalier, and I can't believe I'm actually praising Jeff Cavalier here, he actually defended the face pull and he said that it's not just about hypertrophy and I completely agree. If you add a movement that is contraction focused and it keeps you healthy, that alone makes it worth doing. It's not just, oh, the study said this is better and on average people gain five to 10% more muscle. I mean, that's, that's good, that's noteworthy, that's something, especially if you look at a whole population, but when you're dealing with an individual yeah, short and focused movements, they might actually be better. Because you don't look at the raw data, there are some people who are actually going to respond better to short and focused movements. If you, for some reason, can't recover from a lot of damage... But I warn you, I'll break your... Hamstrings. Already broken. Maybe causing less damage could actually be the way to go. Now, I think you can adapt due to the repeated bout effect, but even so you can probably still include both and benefit from both. By the way, this video is sponsored by Boost Camp. So whether you are lengthy or a shorty, you're gonna want to be tracking and managing your training. Don't just think you're gonna remember it for later, you won't, you absolutely will not. And so having a place to jot that down in the palm of your hand, in your phone, which I don't have because I'm using it to film, but you will have your phone in the gym is super useful. Plus you get access to some of the best programs out there. I myself have three programs up there, Rampage, Ravage, and the Recovering Power Lifter program, all absolutely free. You can check those out. They will serve you well in your quest to get fucking huge. So once again, thank you to Boost Camp for sponsoring this video. Because you have to look at your program as a whole, right? These studies are just comparing this exercise to this exercise. Well, what if you already have a stretch focus movement in your program? Is adding in a second one better than something else? Well, in my experience, that might actually just be too much. You know, I, when I was combining incline dumbbell curls, which is long muscle length, not a massive stretch, but certainly some stretch, and preacher curls, it was just too much. So I find I do one stretch focused movement and then something a little bit more contraction focused, maybe a mid range movement, maybe a neutral grip movement, maybe overhand reverse curl grip, et cetera, because those complement each other well and they're working different muscle groups as well. So it's not just about the biceps, this muscle, you have a lot of muscles in your body and having some variation and variety is a good idea. For example, you might say, oh, leg extensions versus squats. Squats are better because they are longer muscle length, tension, etc. Well, what about the rectus femoris? That's not really going to be trained through squats because they also cause hip flexion. When you're squatting, you want hip extension. And so it's just not a great movement for that muscle because it just shuts down because it doesn't want to be causing a scene at the party, basically. And so if you're already doing squats, hey, maybe a leg extension makes a lot of sense. You have a stretch focus movement in the squat, compound movement, big basic, then the leg extension, it's more contraction focused most of the time. 
And then it also works the rectus femoris, which you didn't really hit with squats. So I think intelligent programming and pairing up exercises well to hit your entire body is the way to go. We have a limited amount of time and energy and resources at our disposal. And therefore, I think thinking about the body in terms of what you actually need and what every exercise is actually doing is just a good idea. And this requires a lot of nuances and not just, oh, long muscle lengths, that's all you need. Well, you probably need a lot of stuff and various exercises are a good idea. Next, let's talk about cheating. So can you cheat a length and focus movement? In most cases, not really. Can you cheat an RDL? Can you cheat a preacher curl? Not really, and I wouldn't advise it because you're already getting a stretch. Why would you try to slingshot through that stretch into the easy part of the range of motion? Whereas if it's a dumbbell lateral raise or if it is a type of row, I think a little bit of oomph makes a lot of sense because you are cheating through the easy part to the difficult part and then you are controlling it on the way down. And so I think that intelligent, controlled, methodical cheating makes a lot of sense with these shortened focused movements, but with lengthened focused ones, it's just not really possible. Similarly, you can also go beyond failure with these shortened focused movements. So if it is a shrug, if it's a calf raise, you can go beyond failure and I think in a lot of cases, you probably should to get the most out of the movement. When you fail a preacher curl, if you fail near the bottom, you're kind of just done. If you fail an RDL, which I don't necessarily recommend, you're just done. There's no partials to be had there. Whereas if you fail a spider curl, I mean, you can fail at the top and you can fail almost at the top and then, you know, three quarters of the way up, two thirds of the way up, halfway up a third of the way up and you can just keep going and going and going. And I think doing it in this way gets you a lot more out of the set because you are training the shortened and the mid range. And then if you go far enough beyond failure, which does take some stones, by the way, you're basically training the lengthened part as well. So you're training the entire part of the range of motion. And I think, I mean, I don't see a ton of studies on this, but I think you're going to get more out of the movement doing it in this way. And that is only really possible with contraction, shortened, focused movements. Next, warming up. So I find on some movements, I want a contraction focused movement before it to really get the joints moving. So one popular choice is having a push down before some type of extension. So if it's a skull crusher, if it's an overhead extension, whatever, having a push down, which is sort of a more contraction focused movement before that, gets the elbows warm, gets the blood flowing, gets you a little bit of a pump, is a push down useless? What about when you use a longer rope and you step back and it's even more contraction focused? I find this to be even more elbow friendly. So generally contraction focused movements, they're just easier on the joints and therefore putting them early in your program makes a lot of sense. Why do you think almost every IFBB pro warms up with leg extensions before their squats? Well, it's because usually they're really, really strong and their knees are taking a beating and they want to get some blood in that area because it just feels better and it's more productive. Now, I can imagine some fucking small nerd going up to them and be like, this is contraction focused movement. This is useless. You get five to 10 percent more hypertrophy if you didn't do that, if you just did another three sets of squats. Well, no, if they did another three sets of squats, they'd, you know, be injured. And so they know their body, they know what they need, they know when they need it. And that is the beauty of programming. It's not as simple as this exercise is better than this one because the study said so. So personally, I like a mix. There are some short and focused movements that I really like. Push downs, spider curls, hammer curls, cable crossovers, back extensions, leg extensions, pretty much any calf ex exercise. Well, I don't like them, but, you know, they're all contraction focused. Pretty much any shrug and pretty much any row. Should we just never do any row because it's much challenging in that contracted position? No, you can work around it by going beyond failure, by cheating slightly, or maybe just doing more volume. Why do you think the back notoriously needs more volume to grow? Well, it's because most of the lifts are actually easier to recover from because when you only go to failure, it's just not very hard to recover from. And so you can spam movements for the back. And I also do lengthened work as well. 
RDLs, preacher curls, sissy squats, dumbbell flies, Bulgarian split squats. Now, what do these have in common? They notoriously make you sore and beat you up, and you just can't handle as many sets for this. How many sets of RDLs could I handle per week? Genuinely to failure, like really, really good, sitting the hips back, getting a big stretch on the hamstrings. How many sets of that could I do per week? Five? Six? <laughs> it's not a ton. Whereas I can add in hamstring curls on top of that without impacting recovery. So look at what is in your program and what could complement that as well as what you need and just what you can recover from. You have to look at everything from an individual basis and not just this exercise is better than this one. And so I want to give a shout out to Dr. Milo Wolf. He's been putting out a lot of content with regards to lengthened focused training. He does entirely lengthen and focus movements himself in his own training. I think that he is very reasonable with his extrapolations from the science. Again, he says 5 to 10% all the time, and I think some other people get a little bit carried away. So uh, check him out on Instagram, Stronger by Science, uh, and check out their information. Very good resource. And Milo has been doing lengthened partial only training for a while, which is ridiculous. Uh, which is why I am going to be doing lengthened partial only training for the entire month of June as a sort of experiment. Wish me luck. So I'll be doing a whole video on that. We're going to see how it is. I don't have high hopes for growth because I'm a fairly advanced natural lifter and things are going to be slow anyway, but I will share my experiences and if it was either awful or really awful. So in summary, stay lengthy, but also stay shortened. Look at your program as a whole, and I don't think shortened focus movements are completely dead. They still have a place in most people's programs. Anyway, if you want to go deeper into the depths of proper programming practices, you can check out my books. They've been very, very highly reviewed. Lots of people have said that they use them on a regular basis. You know how usually you buy an ebook and you're like, cool, and then you, you don't ever use it. This is not one of those books. You're going to be referring back to them on a regular basis, and they're going to be very, very beneficial in a practical way for your hypertrophy results. No promises. You still have to put in the work, and you have to actually read it too, by the way. You know, that's kind of a prerequisite for it being useful, um, but I think you will indeed find it to be beneficial. I will link it in a pinned comment. Thank you so much for the support. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Hmm.